Welcome to the Books and Travel podcast. I'm Jo Francis Penn, thriller and dark fantasy author, bringing you escape and inspiration about unusual and fascinating places, as well as the deeper side of books and travel. You can find the episode show notes, your free monthly reading list, and lots more at booksandtravel.page. Hello, travellers. I'm Jo Francis Penn, and this is episode one of my new Books and Travel podcast. And I'm quite excited <laughs> to share this new direction with you. So why this show after 10 years of the Creative Pen podcast? Because I know many of you will have come over uh, from my show, which is aimed at writers. But this is quite different. And welcome if you've never heard me before on the other show. Uh, but this show is all about reinvention which is also part of what travel means to me. And I'll be talking about on my next uh, solo show, I'll be talking about that reinvention. But when I think about what I want to do with my life for the next 10 years, I like to think about the 10 year span, because if we commit to doing things for 10 years, amazing stuff happens that we may never have expected. So when I think about my life, the main thing that stays the same is books and travel. These are the things I come back to again and again, the things I truly, truly love. I'm also fascinated by the inner and outer journeys that both books and travel can bring. So a change in perspective, uh, an empathy, perhaps an entirely new direction in your life because of something you've read or somewhere you've been or something you've experienced. And so if you know what I mean, then I hope that you're going to enjoy this new podcast. I'm also going to write two books from this material over time. And I have been thinking about a travel memoir for many years. And also I've talked about what is a working title, The Shadow Book, which is very much about creating from the dark side of ourselves. And I've wanted to write these books for many years. Um, they've been bubbling away <laughs> and yet I have not made time for those to emerge. So partly this podcast is me giving time to these books. I don't know what is memoir or what is shadow book at the moment, but I know that by creating this material this way, I will be able to tap into things that I have not tapped into before. And that in itself is quite exciting. I'm also a little scared because it will mean being very transparent, being open about things I haven't shared necessarily before. I might have written about in a fictionalised way, but you might never know what's true and what's not true. So I will be talking about those things on this show over time. <laughs> so what can you expect from books and travel? Uh, first of all, as with my novels, I don't plot everything in advance. I often sit down and make it up as I go along. And so I am going to find my way over time with this podcast, as happened with my other podcast, The Creative Pen. When I started that, I didn't know where I would end up. And I feel that with this show, I'm starting this with an intention, but we'll see where it goes. I do have a metaphor, though, which is the ocean. And the ocean is going to definitely come into many of many of these episodes. But I want to do two aspects in this show. First of all, the dappled light of turquoise shallows. And I want you to picture that in your mind. Uh, you're safe. You're maybe just paddling, you've got your feet in, you're in the sun, you've got a cocktail in your hand or a fruit juice or whatever you like to drink, and sparkling water, uh, wine. You're enjoying the simple joys of a new place. And so I will be talking about my travels and also interviewing authors around the places that inspire our writing. And we will talk about 
food and drink and the lighter side of travel, which uh, will help you explore. We'll also be looking at what books you might like to read about places. So that will be the lighter side of travel. But I also want to explore what I'm calling the dark midnight depths. And that to me is that edge of challenge and a pull to the deep and some mystery and the things that are that little bit darker around travel. It's not all sweetness and light. It's not all cocktails and tapas. (laughs) Uh, We go to travel and we go to books for that challenge, for a change, for deeper meaning. And so I want to explore uh, perhaps what is the most important exploration of all, which is the inner transformation, the inner journey. So I'll be talking about both of those things. Now, the booksandtravel.page website will have articles as well about things that continue to fascinate me. Uh, As this first episode goes out, there are articles on um, uh, anatomy museums and also about London as a place and different things that you might be interested in over time as well. I will be sharing my photos on the website and also on Instagram at jfpenauthor. That's where I share my ongoing photos. But every single one of these podcasts and also the articles will have photos uh, of my own that I will be sharing over time. And every month I'm also going to do a reading list. So on the last day of every month, I'm going to try and be super organised. On the last day of the month, I will email out a reading list um, with links to to some of the books and the places that might interest you uh, from the month of uh, content that goes out there from the podcast, from book recommendations, from articles, that type of thing. And you can subscribe to that at booksandtravel.page forward slash read. And as ever, if you just go to booksandtravel.page, you'll see all the links. Okay, so let's get into the topic of uh, my first show. And I want to start with three trips that have changed my life that have maybe even more than that, they have shaped my philosophy of life. And they're not necessarily the highlights, you know, the, the best places I've ever been. But my life would certainly look a whole lot different if I hadn't uh, experienced these things. Now, uh, some of these, in fact, yeah, most of these are in the early days of, well, in fact, there was no digital photography. So there are pictures on uh, the show notes. <laughs> In fact, there's even a picture of me with a lion uh, as a child. And uh, But it was back in the day, if you remember, when you took 24 photos on your camera with a, a film, a cartridge film, and then you developed the 24 and one of them or two of them were all right and the rest you had to throw away. Ah, oh, those are the days. <laughs> um, so I do have some pictures, but they're actually photos of old photos. Uh, but they're quite cool to look at. Number one, shall we get a new kitchen or shall we go back to Malawi for Christmas? 1986. So my mum spoke those words to me and my little brother. Back in 1986, I was just 11 years old and we were living in Bristol in the southwest of England, not actually far from where I live now. Um, and in a house, you know, we, we didn't have that much money Um we lived in a house that needed some work. I mean, if you had some money, having a better kitchen um, would probably be a good thing. (laughs) Um, It was pretty grotty. It was completely livable. You know, my mum was awesome, but there was no hesitation for any of us. That question was almost didn't need to be asked. But the fact is, my mum always involved us in that type of decision making. And um, Uh, My parents divorced, so we were brought up by my single mum. And uh, this was a question. It was, what do we spend this little bit of money on? I don't know whether she'd got a a bonus or something, but we had this bit of money. And so we did indeed go back to Malawi and headed to Lake Malawi that Christmas of 1986. Now, we had lived in Malawi, Central Africa. If you don't know where that is, go look it up on a map. That's going to be part of this show. (laughs) Looking things up on maps, which is fun. Um, But yes, we 
Uh, after my parents divorced, my mum went to teach uh, in Blantyre at the Polytechnic. And uh, a year or so after they uh, got divorced, we went out as well. So this is not about living in Malawi, because to me, that was not travel. In fact, my that year of living there, going to school there, I'm not even talking about that today. Um, what I'm talking about is this going back, this decision to go back, spending money on travel at such an early point. So um, I went to the school and if you do want to have a look at the show notes, I went to St Andrew's School and the picture of me with the lion comes from that time. I also do have an abiding memory of being spanked with a tacky. And if you have any knowledge of Africa, uh, African um, sort of expat language, the tacky being a plimsoll, uh, which or, or a, I guess a sneaker, you might say in America, um, which we used to get spanked with. <laughs> This was back in the day when that was allowed. Perhaps it still is. Who knows? Uh, I don't even remember how I deserved that. I'm sure I didn't because I'm such a good girl. <laughs> but um, I do remember flying the the first... This was back in the day when there was smoking on planes, if you can believe it. I remember us being in the back of the plane covering our faces with uh, clothing because my mum didn't want us to breathe in the smoke Um incredible that people used to be allowed to smoke on planes. <laughs> I do remember also going into the cockpit and looking out the cockpit as uh, dawn rose over the Sahara Desert. And I wonder, and I'll come back to deserts in future shows because deserts are still, to me, one of the, the most um, romantic places. I, I very much love deserts. Okay, so going back to that trip, we we went back to Malawi and I remember my mum driving us down to Monkey Bay by the lake and giant baobab trees stretching up to the blue sky above. Of course, there was no air conditioning in the car. <laughs> So we had the windows down. She used to give it like we were never allowed sweets. Seriously, she used to give us a lemon. We I remember us like sticking my finger into this lemon and, and licking the lemon juice. I mean, seriously, we 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 had great teeth. <laughs> but um so I remember that I also remember uh Paul Simon's album Graceland on the tape deck because of course we had a tape back then uh, but the sound of Graceland if you haven't listened to that album for a while um, listen to that because it also has the African vocals and so the sound of Africa playing as we drove along this dirt road and then we got to the lake and we used to stay in this little uh, campsite area and there were whoa so many cockroaches <laughs> in the toilet. My mum used to come with me to the toilet and smash the cockroaches so they didn't um, run up my legs. <laughs> uh, that was oh, fun times with the cockroaches. But uh, I remember my mum windsurfing. She was a great windsurfer and we paddled on lilos um, in the water. And uh, actually Lake Malawi is known for having some of um, the most uh, in incredible fish uh, there. So I, I remember I didn't didn't snorkel or anything then. So I don't know why, but uh, I you know we definitely swam in the water, jumped in the water, but I didn't snorkel. I remember drinking bright purple Fanta grape, which is a flavour I haven't really seen uh, outside of Africa. And we used to have chicken in a basket, which was fried chicken with chips, which to me was the height of decadence and I used to look forward to chicken in a basket so much. Um, that year we spent Christmas Day by a friend's swimming pool, South African family. We had braai, uh, barbecue, uh, the South African word for barbecue, for lunch and I remember swimming in their pool and the warmth of sun on our skin and wrapping paper around the pool and just glorious, glorious, happy memories. Um, I also remember that year, I'm pretty sure it was that year, we watched uh, a censored version of the film Teen Wolf, if you remember that, with Michael J. Fox. And it didn't make sense. I think I remember it because it didn't make sense. And I later saw an uncensored version. <laughs> and that made more sense. And I think I also remember it because when we arrived home in the freezing cold winter January with colours of grey and rain and darkness, the contrast was, was dramatic and it felt like we might never see another summer. That 
loss of colour is something I often think about. And we never did go back to Malawi again. I have never been back again. And part of me is scared too because that trip, well, the, the memories, sometimes if you go back, it's disappointing. I'll talk about that in another episode at some point. Uh, but it remains in my heart as a place I loved, a time I loved, and bright and colourful and full of laughter. And things, because I was a child, I never experienced the, the politics of Malawi in a difficult way. Uh, of course, if you look at the history of, of many nations, <laughs> there are times that are more difficult. And, you know, I'm not going to talk about politics. I'm just going to talk about memory and travel and things. But I do remember it as a wonderful, wonderful country. But the reason that trip shaped my life is because we chose experience over possessions. And we we spent my mum's hard-earned money on travel and adventure instead of on a new kitchen. (laughs) And that decision has shaped definitely my mum and my brother and me over and over again through our whole life. And I still live in a minimalistic way. I crave memories and now photos. I do share a lot of photos and take a lot of photos with my phone. I don't have many objects from my journeys. I have a a few, but I have, I have nothing from, from Malawi. My mum still has some, um, some pieces of, of, um, of hardwood carved elephants, but I, I don't. I have nothing from from that trip. I have very few things from my travels. But it's interesting because my mum is even now at 71 training to walk the Silk Road this year on a trip. And my brother has travelled the world as an international photographer. And we all live in this kind of minimalist way and we all travel as much as possible. So I look back at that decision, that question, shall we get a new kitchen or shall we go back to Malawi for Christmas? That is a moment that continues to shape my life. The second trip that shaped my journey, I guess, is Jerusalem, Israel, 1991. So I was 16 and I travelled to Israel as part of a Christian youth group teaching English and volunteering at a school in a village called Bet Jala on the West Bank of Israel. And uh, again, I'm not going to be too political with this show. Um, The words used so often can be difficult. So if you prefer Palestine, if you prefer West Bank of Israel, either way, uh, that's where I was going. So it was my first taste of almost independent travel. So I was going with uh, a youth group, but um, you know, my mum wasn't there. My family, I had no family there. I, I knew a couple of the people. Obviously, I had some friends, but I was, I absolutely respect my mum for letting me go to what it still is an area of conflict in the world when I was uh, 16. And of course, it was only a few months after the end of Gulf War One. And um, there were still reports of missiles flying around. And generally, it was a sort of Uh, definitely a tense uh, time. And yeah. And one night we were, we stayed um, with some locals and I went out on the streets with some of the Palestinian uh, students. I remember, you know, we, I was 16, the kids we were hanging out with were 15, 16, 17. And, uh, you know, we were out and after there were very few streetlights, a very different situation, um, the occupied territories. And one night we were out and there were shots fired and we ran down the street and some of the kids were throwing stones and, and there were soldiers and the smell of burning tires or rubbish or whatever it was. And I remember feeling there were, there were gunshots, there were stones, there was the sound of, of stones on metal and there was no bloodshed or anything, but it was the first time that I had seen conflict, real conflict and heard of hatred on two sides of what seemed like 
uh, well, still is a difficult situation. And it was a street battle by night and it, I felt that it could have fled into something greater. That may be my memory. It probably was nothing, but I was 16 um, from a you know pretty protected background. And I remember I, I was with a, a, a girl and we rolled under this car and lay there and I was like, what am I doing under this car on the West Bank? And there were people shooting. This is not good. Now, I never told my mum what happened, so uh, if she ever listens to this, uh, she would find out. But I remember feeling like, oh my goodness, I can't ever tell her because she would never let me go away again. Of course, this was the days before cell phones, before <laughs> before the internet, <laughs> before we reported back home seconds after an event. And now someone with a 16 year old would expect to hear about a situation. But for us, you know, we didn't even phone home. It was okay, I'll see you in a couple of weeks when we get back from our trip. And I'm grateful that I was not able to call my mum because I was able to wait that situation out. I was able to understand it from the perspective of the people I was with. And the other thing about that trip to, to Israel Yes, we worked, uh, I say worked, we were volunteering, teaching English and doing assemblies and cleaning and things as youth groups do around the world. Uh, and we also visited the sites of Israel. So we uh, we went up into Galilee, we went um, to Jerusalem, and I remember touching the Western Wall for the first time. And also this was in the days when you could still access the Dome of the Rock really easily. And I went up there and it was stunningly beautiful. I love the colour blue and there are these gorgeous blue tiles with lovely Arabic writing on. And but of course there are so many soldiers there the with big guns and in Britain we just don't have <laughs> We don't have police with guns everywhere. Well, we didn't used to. I guess we do more now, but not certainly not like Israel or America, that many guns. And I think partly that trip gave me an appreciation of borders because we passed through these checkpoints. And this was before there was a wall uh, through the middle of, uh, well, sort of carving off the occupied territories. But I we went through a lot of checkpoints and I felt like an other and i the 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 word other with a capital o is something that comes up again and again in my fiction feeling like the other is something that often happens when you travel and it's a it's an important feeling because that's how people feel when they come to your country to your place and so i felt like the other i f understood borders i felt uh, an undercurrent of tension that, of course, has exploded again and again. I also saw another side to the history of religion, and uh, I, I did have a faith at that time. I, I, I had a Christian faith, and so I was in the Holy Land. I was in the city where Jesus had walked, and here Abraham had taken Isaac up to to sacrifice, and and all of this. And I was experiencing the deep historic and religious resonance in the place. I also saw a little more complication in my romantic view of religion in the Ethiopian Coptics who are on the roof of the Holy Sepulchre, but the only place they're allowed because they are so poor. Um, they're not allowed in the main church. Uh, they're also some of the, you know, the most ancient Christians. And I, I will come back to that when I talk about Stone of Fire, but I wrote about that years and years later. And in fact, Morgan Sierra, who's my main character in the Arcane series, is uh, half Jewish. Her father uh, is Jewish. And that heritage of both loving both the Jewish and Palestinian sides of Israel and also feeling like an outsider, because, of course, if your father's Jewish and your mother is not, then technically you're not Jewish. So I made Morgan more of an other, more of an outsider, but with a deep love for the country. So I got a glimpse into the history and I went back over and over again to Israel. And I, I'll do a separate 
podcast on on this in more detail, I guess. But I went back to, you know, Jerusalem and over again, I I worked up in Galilee for a peace organisation. I partied in Elat one one year. Um, I did many trips back to try and help with things. My last trip was in 2016 and I wrote about that in End of Days. Um, But what happened, I guess, so that was 1991, my first trip. And in 1993, Yasser Arafat and Yitzhak Rabin shook hands on the White House lawn. And I still have the newspaper. I actually do have that as an artefact, the newspaper where they shook hands. And I got a place at Oxford University to study Arabic because I wanted to go and work in the Middle East. I wanted to work for peace and do, be in the foreign office and essentially do that. But I, uh, the course was classical Arabic, so I switched to theology, to studying um, religion, specialising in the psychology of religion. And then I still thought I was going to work in the Middle East. And then on the 4th of November 1995, Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated. And I still remember the day because I was thinking, I hope a Palestinian didn't do it because it would have sparked a a war. Actually, it was a fundamentalist Jew who killed him. And I was 20 that year and I still sort of, I still remember the devastation at that moment because I realised that peace in the Middle East would be hard one. And I still have hopes for that area. But of course, (laughs) not much has changed. Everything's changed or nothing has changed. So uh, it's one of those those things. Um, But I did my thesis on obedience in fundamentalist religion because of what Yigal Amir said when he uh, assassinated, when asked about the assassination, he said God told him to do it. And that comes up in my uh, book, Crypt of Bone, which is all about terrorism in the name of God. And so this obsession with why do people do things in the name of God? Why can't everyone just be nice? (laughs) Is something I come back to over and over again. And the complications uh, in that way. And I don't think I could have ever foreseen my love for Israel as turning into a career as a fiction author, which is essentially what has happened. Um, I thought I would be in the politics arena, but I've turned it into something else. I do think that you can learn a lot from reading books. And as I continue to study and learn, uh, I try and bring my passion in there. Uh, I would also recommend The Source by James Michener, a fantastic book which I read again and again. And it brings the history alive uh, around uh, the biblical Armageddon, um, a, a city called Megiddo. And that book is really brilliant. So definitely recommend that. So that's the second trip that really shaped my life, Jerusalem, Israel in 1991. And the final trip I want to talk about is blue water sailing on the tall ship Soren Larsen from Fiji to Vanuatu, 1999. So 1999, remember, (laughs) pre-millennium, Uh, I was living in London. I was working as a business consultant. I was essentially using caffeine tablets and coffee and painkillers by day and alcohol by night, Uh, quite a lot of alcohol to get me through a job I hated. I was basically implementing accounts payable and financial systems into large corporates. I'd been doing that since I had left Oxford in 1997. Now, it was great money being a management consultant. It was also an incredible party time. Uh, If you remember pre-Enron, those of you in the corporate space, pre-Enron, there was a lot of money in consulting. And uh, before many of those companies were split into different areas because of mismanagement, Uh, that happened with Enron. Essentially, we were partying hard. There were huge expense accounts. And this was preparing for the millennium bug, if you can remember that uh, disaster that never happened. (laughs) So I was was living in London, but I was working in um, 
Brussels. I was working in Southampton. I was working in Finland, Holland. So I was traveling a lot for work, but uh, I went back to London every weekend and uh, sometimes more often. And I was, I was desperate to leave. I felt like I had these golden handcuffs. I I was bound to my job. It wasn't just the money, you know, I was paying back my student loan, which wasn't very big, to be honest, back in those days, but I still, you know, I had bills to pay. But it was also the expectation of society, not just um, my friends, I guess, but also the sort of climb the corporate ladder, do this thing (laughs) and settle down, be responsible. Uh, You've had your flitting around because I'd taken a year off before I went to university and every summer I'd done other things to be told at other points. <laughs> but I I just, I didn't know what to do. I really didn't. And I don't even know how it, I found it, but I saw that I could do this trip to the South Pacific and I would uh, get on this tall ship in Fiji and sail to Vanuatu. And I thought, this sounds like a great idea. <laughs> So I will go on my own to the South Pacific and I will figure my life out. That's essentially what I thought. And it's interesting because I have thought this many, many times and we will come back to this, I'm sure. But in the times of my life when I need to figure stuff out, I tend to go elsewhere. (laughs) But I remember arriving in Lautoka in Fiji. I had never been to the South Pacific before. I was on my own. I travelled a lot on my own uh, in my 20s. And so it wasn't an issue. uh, But I do remember people walking in the cool of the pre-dawn. So that darkness before the sun comes up. I distinctly remember people walking there. And the bright hand painted adverts on buildings, which is so different. I think that that's quite common in the South Pacific, but not in uh, the UK or America or or other places where often they're, you know, sort of um, put on with with glue or whatever. Um, There were little shops. I think this is another aspect. These small shops selling things as opposed to big superstores. And also this mix of uh, Fijian Indian and also the native Fijian uh, South Pacific people who looked quite different, even though Fijian Indian are now Fijian, they have a very different uh, history. Um, So the skin tone was different, their names a different and again the politics of Fiji is the politics and history is is fascinating another time <laughs> I have so much to talk about on this new show so I'll, I'll get to everything over time so anyway I arrived uh, on this tall ship and I am at I haven't written about this trip at all yet I do have a book that I want to write uh, a, a novel set on a tall ship so I will no doubt get back to this. But I joined the Soren Larsen and we, you know, we were paying passengers, but we became part of the crew. And so, you know, we met people. Um, I made friends with another single woman who was traveling, um, an American. (laughs) And uh, we, you know, got underway. We sailed away from Fiji and almost as soon as we made it out of sight of land I got seasick I got horribly seasick along with probably half the other passengers and spent 24 hours you know vomiting violently but then it passed and I joined the rhythms of the watch and this is one of those magical things if you do a uh, sea trip where you're sort of joining in, not just being a passenger, because uh, the watch you would spend, um, I think we had four hours on, eight hours off or something like that, but certainly four hours on. And I love to sit on bow watch. So I would love to sit up the front of the boat watching the waves. And I mean, bow watch is meant to be sort of watching out for obstacles and other things. (laughs) But, you know, mainly the hours passed with no thought of anything except the sea and... I don't know, thinking about my life. I don't know what I was thinking about. I I do think that it was probably just meditation most of the time. Uh, It did rain for days. And um, I remember the water sort of on those, some days, you know, water coming up on the decks and it was, it could be quite, quite violent in ways, but it didn't matter because I could not 
be the person that I was in London. I was um, a different person out there on the ocean. Now, I wasn't very good with rigging. I don't like low heights. Like I'm fine with really like going up in a plane and stuff, but I couldn't get up that rigging. (laughs) But I did flake the anchor chain and I have put the picture of me flaking the chain uh, on the show notes for this. And I can still feel the weight of it on my hands and also the back pain from the day after. I just insisted on doing this very dirty job um, because I felt like, I don't know why I did it, but I did it. Uh, We slept in these tiny bunks. If you've been on uh, sort of big yachts, any kind of of boats, um, you know, your your sleeping space is is not very big. And I shared a a room with, with the American friend I'd I'd made and I remember it sm- it did really smell of sweat down in this boat and salt and it was I don't remember it being super pleasant below decks maybe because it was so wet upstairs for most of it um I was also on these anti-malarial tablets which I must have taken something in Africa but I think these were different because I dreamt I dreamt of so many things, very vivid, vivid dreams. So I have a journal from that trip which goes into these sort of violent and quite sexual dreams. Uh, I was 20, what was I, 24? (laughs) So fair enough. (laughs) But it was, um, yeah, I remember how crazy they were. Now, I also had my first snorkeling trip. Uh, This was a huge moment in a shallow reef on the edge of an island. And I also remember putting my face under the water for the first time and being absolutely panic stricken to see fish so close to my face. I think the other thing is that I had, um, I'd always worn glasses since I was about 11. I wore glasses, but then I I was wearing contact lenses in the South Pacific so I could actually scuba dive. And I remember climbing back onto the boat so fast because I was hyperventilating in fear and I scraped the flesh off the front of my thighs. <laughs> but then I calmed down and eventually, obviously it really hurt when I got back in the water, but I did anyway. And it was magical. And I saw turtles for the first time and, and the fish. And it was the first time I'd sort of been in tropical waters. And the beginning of my love for scuba diving, which is again, something else I will talk of at another time. And uh, yeah, I also, on that trip, we went to the uh, island of Ambrim in the Vanuatu and walked up this volcano and the the smell of sulfur and the black dirt. It was so black, this volcano, and sort of that black sticking to sweat and the jungle of that island was so different to being on the boat out in the water. Um, But I did get a lift back to the boat because I decided I couldn't deal with this volcano. I went back to the boat and got a lift in an outrigger, (laughs) which is one of those canoes with a sort of separate um, stabilising thing. And the guy paddling, he had a Nike symbol, a Nike swoosh on his paddle and at that point again pre-internet pre things it was just an a, a very interesting insight that on this car in this carved wooden canoe in the you know an, an outlying island in Vanuatu Nike <laughs> had appeared and yeah you can be on the opposite side of the world and still feel like you can't get far away enough <laughs> and of course now wi-fi and smartphones are, you know the world is a, a lot smaller I also did have a summer fling with uh, a Kiwi engineer, New Zealander, uh, the engineer for the boat. And that was a marvellous time. Again, I was 24. (laughs) No judgment. (laughs) Um, And he gave me a carved wooden turtle necklace, which I, so I would remember my snorkeling experience. But what that did give more than anything is that I learned over those few weeks that there's another life out there, that you can just walk away. You can just leave. And the crew working on that boat had just left. They had 
got on the boat and they were working their passage. And the world doesn't end if you resign your job and give something else a try. And that people live. You need food, you need somewhere to sleep, but you don't need to live the corporate life killing yourself in London. And I wrote in my journal, uh, I found this that I'd written, ever restless, never satisfied, but briefly there I was still. And it's interesting to read that because (laughs) I, I am still ever restless. I am still never satisfied. And there are these moments of stillness. But I returned to my job in September 1999, but I had made a decision to change my life. I resigned on my 25th birthday in March 2000 and headed to Perth, travelling around Australia and on to New Zealand, sparked by my summer fling. Of course, I never saw him again. (laughs) But I only moved back to the UK in 2011 after leaving in 2000. Obviously, I came back to visit my family. But that trip on the Soren Larsen in 1999 spun my whole life towards the Southern Hemisphere and started a whole new chapter. Now, whenever I go back to Auckland, I walk down the Viaduct Harbour uh, in New Zealand along the wharf where the tall ships moor up. And uh, I actually think the Soren is now in Sydney Harbour. Um, but I have seen the Soren in Auckland and I also saw it once in Tonga. And it just makes me smile to remember that trip and to think that just a couple of weeks on that boat changed my life. So those are the three trips that have shaped my life of travel and writing and that changed the direction of where I was going, I guess, and things that I still remember made a difference. I would love to know what you think about this new show. You can leave a comment on the show notes. Just go to booksandtravel.page forward slash podcast and you'll see episode one. (laughs) You can leave a comment there. I would really love to know what you think. And also if you have any questions or thoughts and uh, over time I'm going to be sharing a lot more on this show about my personal journey and also have interviews with other people on how travel has changed them. So happy traveling and I'll see you next time. Thanks for joining me today on the Books and Travel podcast. I hope you found a moment of escape. You can find the episode show notes your free monthly reading list and lots more at booksandtravel.page. Happy travels until next time.